he had a great eye for for talent. He recruited uh, faculty and built really a, a superb infectious disease division. And, and uh, the folks who are currently here are, are really his legacy. He was recognized uh, on multiple occasions for his mentorship. IDSA, the Infectious Disease Society of America, awarded him the Walter Stamm Mentor Award in 2008. Uh, but more than that, he was an, an incredible person. He had, a, he had a great humanity, he had a great understanding of, of patients, and that was really a critical issue when all of his mentorship uh, for the many people here uh, who, with whom he interacted, the one thing that, that was key to, to Jerry's approach to medicine was that the patient was at the center of the interaction, and I think that legacy uh, remains. So um, I'm going to hand over now to uh, the co-director of the division, uh, Dan Phillips, to introduce uh, this year's Gerald Mellon Visiting Professor. Thanks, Phil. Well, it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief at the New England Journal of Medicine. I I've known Eric for 20 years, so I can really attest to the fact that he is just a perfect person to honor Dr. Medoff's legacy, because like Dr. Medoff, he's really adored by his trainees and colleagues. His achievements are many. Prior to serving as editor-in-chief, he was the Irene Heinz Given Professor at the Harvard School of Public Health and Chair of the Department of Immunology and Infectious Diseases. He's um, a member of the National Academy of Medicine and the American Academy of Physicians, to name but a few of his uh, many accolades. But I hope I can capture a little bit more about what makes Eric so special and why he's really um, well-suited to honor the legacy of Dr. Madoff, in addition to all of his very many accolades. So uh, I first met Eric when I was a resident, and as a fellow, I had the pleasure of seeing patients with Eric on the ID consult service. And despite his many obligations, including now at the New England Journal, he continues to see patients with fellows on the consult service. He's mentored dozens of graduate students, postdocs, and fellows who've gone on to lead their own labs at, um, at prominent institutions across the country and internationally. He's been very involved in graduate education in the United States and Africa. He serves as PI on an infectious disease training grant. He founded a graduate program in uh, bacteriology, and he serves on advisory committees for training uh, scientists, both in Cape Town and in a Pan-African program. And in addition to really mentoring, he's made enormous contributions in um, the field of mycobacterial pathogenesis. Among his uh, many achievements, he's really developed a lot of uh, tools and creative approaches to move the field forward. So I'll just give you one an example because I think it also illustrates a little bit about Eric's personality. So he pioneered this uh, methodology that really opened the genome of TB to interrogation at a time where the genome was sequenced, but we really didn't know what all these genes did. And it delivered you know, a whole panel of potential drug targets to the field. And um, it was really the predecessor to transposon sequencing, something that people now know well. So he developed this like really great technology. And then in his typical self-effacing manner, he named it trash. So <laughs> it was anything but trash. Uh, that stood for something, transpose on site hybridization. But any, yeah, it was anything but trash. And he's really made, um, gone on to make enormous scientific contributions. His work has revealed how the mycobacterial cell envelope is uh, made and organized, how cell division in mycobacteria is regulated, how protein turnover is regulated. But he always takes this really fundamental insight and pushes it further to try and say, you know, what can we learn about antimicrobial drug resistance? What, how can we use this information to develop new and better therapeutics? He's worked on trying to understand how vaccines work or in the TB field, that's really how they fail. And um, he's come up with a lot of creative approaches to try and move the field uh, forward faster. So um, really in summary, Eric's career has been characterized by I think his commitment to um, creative approaches to tackling really big problems, his dedication to educating physicians and scientists, and his um, overall contributions to improving human health. And so I think he'll tell us a bit about his uh, mycobacterial work, but also how maybe this got much more complicated in the environment of COVID-19 and being an editor at the New England Journal of Medicine. So please welcome Eric. <laughs> 
Thank you. Am I okay now? Okay, thank, thanks. Jen, thank you so much for a very, very gracious introduction. Um, and um, I am really honored uh, to, to be here um, at a place that's so important for infectious disease and for this lecture named for uh, Jerry Medoff. I, um, uh, not only we're, we're both infectious disease doctors, but we do actually share some interests that occurred to me when I saw Bill's, um, um, <laughs> Bill, Bill's, Bill's introduction. Um, I, I knew Jerry very slightly, uh, 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 having encountered him many years ago, and I would say that everything uh, that you had to say about him, Bill, was uh, true. Um, um, and yet, um, one of the things that Jerry did was he uh, uh, co-originated and co-edited uh, uh, one of the major um, microbiology textbooks. Um, this is the first edition, a collector's item. Um, it's a collector's item because nothing in it is actually true any longer. <laughs> um, and 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 he and his um, and the other editors assembled a very distinguished team of uh, ID clinicians and microbiologists uh, to author this, um, and it continues to be published uh, today in uh, more correct versions. Um, but among the people who contributed to it was an extremely undistinguished and, and um, non-expert graduate student who wrote one of the chapters. Um, and, and to give you an idea of the quality of the chapter, there's a, there's a case in this, uh, a case of botulism in this presented that as I recall starts out uh, with Mr. S, not his real name. Um, <laughs> um, so Jerry did have some lapses in judgment, I have to say. Um, Today, I'm going to talk about none of the things that Jen uh, introduced me, but I'm sorry, Jen. Um, um, in, instead, I, I do want to talk about a, a, uh, a, a, a pandemic um, that really you know, swept the globe, changed society across the globe, and, and, and particularly in the US, but not the one you might be thinking about, not the one that started in 2019. I'm going to start, I want to talk about some, about the 1850s, actually. Uh, which was uh, slightly before COVID, um, and, and talk about tuberculosis and how it helped shape our uh, shape our country. Um, and and, and it, St. Louis, of course, is the gateway to the West. And why were people going to the West? For a lot of reasons. Um, among them, tuberculosis. And I'll make that case here. I'm going to actually tell this story through the uh, the story of a this individual. This guy was named. Uh, John, he was born in August of 1951. Um, he would, which would make him now what about 170 years old if he had not gotten TB. Um, he was born in uh, in Griffin, Georgia, uh, which is uh, maybe not a place you've heard of. This is his uh, father, Major Major Henry. He, Henry was a uh, had fought in the um, uh, Mexican American War. Um, kind of an interesting guy, and then went on to serve in the Confederate Army. Um, this is uh, the uh, John's mother, Alice, and one of the very few uh, pictures of him. They lived in, uh, they, uh, she was a major, uh, came from a family that were major landowners, which actually played an important part of his life. Um, and in fact, they contributed the money for the Confederate training camp, uh, which was located in Griffin. Of course, um, you probably no, Griff, you probably do know Griffin, but for other reasons, it's the site where Driving Miss Daisy was filmed, um, along with WandaVision um, and The Walking Dead. Um, so um, there are many modern references. This is John's uncle. John, uh, uh, John's uncle was a doctor um, and very influential in John's upbringing um, it, it, for both um, emotional and physical reasons. The first physical reason was that John was born with a cleft palate, uh, which in those days could be a death sentence because infants couldn't feed well. Um, and uh, at age of eight weeks, his, uh, his uncle did a, a cleft palate repair, which worked. Uh, it left him with a, a, lit, a, a um, speech impediment for the rest of his life, uh, which may have influenced something people speculate may have influenced his personality, uh, but certainly was able to uh, eat and grow normally. And he had a relatively normal upbringing until um, 
later in his, uh, when he became uh, at about age 10 or 11, his mother was diagnosed with TB and she went on to have a lingering death and died when he was 15 years old. This was uh, not only a personal tragedy, but uh, was very uh, disruptive. And not, not only did she die, but seven years later, his brother, his adopted brother, his, his father had adopted a, uh, a boy in Mexico when he was in the Mexican-American War, also died of TB. Um, so TB became very important. And, and that led his father to leave town um, and move to uh, Valdosta, Georgia, which is the home of the Wild Adventures theme park. I don't, don't think it was there at the time. Um, um, and his father became mayor and opened up a nursery. Um, and, and this was the location of a new school called the Valdosta Institute. John was sent there where he was a, um, actually a pretty good student, although he was known as a troublemaker, um, um, which uh, kind of followed him. He, he wanted to be a doctor. Um, he didn't really have the behavior for it, although he did have the grades. So he, and rather than follow directly in his uncle's footsteps, he decided to become a dentist. Um, and there was no dental school down south um, at the time. So he went up to um, Philadelphia to what would later become the Penn's uh, School of Dentistry um, and, and studied there. Um, back then, it was a two-year program. There was no college required. Um, so since he's since he left school at age 16, um, he started and completed the pro uh, program at, at age 18, um, which uh, uh, has some effect on his life, actually. Um, he was actually supposed to be a pretty, very good dental student. He graduated near the top of his class. Um, and in fact, there was a, a girl he, um, he um, replaced a crown on uh, when she was six years old, um, who um, died, um, about 30 years ago with that crown still in place. Incredible. He did pretty well, um, but in order to be a dentist, he ne you needed to have a, um, a, you needed to be 21 years old. And of course he was uh, 18 or 19 by the time he graduated. So he had to find other, um, other things to do. So while he was waiting, he, he traveled to various places and somewhere along the way, he met this woman, uh, Mary Catherine uh, Horney, she had this very unusual background. Um, she was Hungarian, uh, born in Hungary. Um, her parents um, immigrated to the US. Her father was a physician, uh, actually a prominent physician. Her mother was a teacher. Uh, they were a firmly middle-class uh, educated family, but tragically both parents died young. She was placed in the care of a cousin. Uh, she hated it, she ran away, and then had this sort of schizophrenic life where she uh, first joined a convent and then a brothel. Um, and somewhere along the way, she married, she, she met um, John and they ended up marrying, maybe marrying, maybe not marrying, but spending their, uh, much of their life together. Um, for some reason, and I don't see it in this picture, she was known as Big Nose Kate and Will she'll, she'll, um, and, and, and she did uh, spend a lot of time with him. Um, John returned to, at, eventually returned to Atlanta uh, where he uh, went to work as a, an apprentice uh, for uh, this uh, dentist, uh, Dr. A.C. Ford. Started out pretty well, but then he developed the symptoms of tuberculosis. Um, and he knew what that meant. And his, his uncle knew what that meant. Um, it was a death sentence in his, uh, it, as, as, as far as he knew. And his, his uncle thought that he only had months to live. So he took his uncle's advice, which was at the time to go move to somewhere with a better climate because climate was supposed to be extremely important in, uh, in TB. Um, so um, he headed out west-ish um, and ended up in Dallas, Texas. And there he went into business as a, um, uh, as a dentist with a partner uh, and they were very successful. Um, uh, particularly the artificial teeth business. In fact, they um, entered some of their teeth into the uh, Dallas County Fair um, and had and took first prize in several categories. Um, you know, fairs may have been different then, um, <laughs> um, uh, but they were they were actually very respected and uh, did a very good business. Unfortunately, 
there were also temptations in Dallas. And uh, there was this area out toward Fort Worth called uh, Hell's Half Acre, which was the red light district um, of the time. And uh, he found that he really enjoyed this. Um, he enjoyed gambling. And in fact, most of his life would be taken, subsequent life would be taken up by gambling. Um, and a little bit of gunplay too. Um, and there were probably incidents that happened here. Now, that really didn't work out well for the dentistry business. Two things. First off, he had reputational issues. And the second thing is he coughed on his patients. And that was not considered to be like really great. Um, uh, so he, he ended up leaving and moving to um, Fort Griffin, Texas, which is the now the home of the uh, Texas State Longhorn uh, herd. Um, and um, uh, off with, uh, with uh, Kate and the two of them settled there, and there he met a very interesting man who would affect the rest of his life. Um, this is Deputy Marshal Wyatt Earp. Um, so Earp was there chasing down a gang of outlaws, and he and John became fast friends. Um, so, um, and, and there weren't very many opportunities um, in Fort Griffin, so um, uh, Wyatt Earp suggested that John move to Dodge City. Um, where there was a need for dentists, he said. Um, so they <laughs> they went there, and and it was there that um, uh, John supposedly saved Wyatt Earps from a confrontation, an armed confrontation, uh, which made them close with, with some bumps in the road for the rest of their lives, or for the rest of John's life anyway. Um, this is where things got a little complicated because uh, Wyatt Earp took a commission to from a railroad company to build a railroad through this valley here. Um, there were two competing railroad companies and there was another gang of gunmen who took a commission from the um, other railroad company. Um, so um, Earp recruited um, John to be part of his gang. Uh, they armed up. Uh, fortunately, this was settled peacefully because um, uh, Earp ended up taking a $10,000 bribe and sold out the company. So it worked out well all around. Um, uh, by the way, this was just for people who were interested in the West. This, the, the, the White Earps uh, gang was led by uh, Sheriff Pat Masterson um, at the time. Um, <clears throat> so um, John left after that and moved to again, um, dentistry was not going that well, and he moved to this um, uh, to Las Vegas, uh, New Mexico, um, which, as you can tell, is a thriving town, um, and opened up a saloon um, and did a little bit of dentistry in the saloon, but primarily did primarily gambled in the saloon. Um, again, was involved in gunplay, and he actually might well have shot shot and killed someone uh, while living here. So it wasn't the most comfortable place, um, and um, or came by and uh, persuaded him that uh, he should move to a place with real opportunity. And when you think about a place with real opportunity, you think of a place named Tombstone. Um, so he moved, they moved to Tombstone, Arizona, uh, which had no dentists, by the way. Um, Earp's brother Virgil was a, um, was a, uh, was a deputy marshal there. Um, and he was the city's police chief. Um, and there was this um, dispute going on. There were two factions in town, um, and they were led by what in those days were Democrats and Republicans. Um, the re the um, Democrats were Texans who were trying to move in on the town um, and take it over. The Republicans were led by people who lived there, who hired on uh, the Earps, along with John, um, to protect their interests. Uh, the the uh, the Texans hired uh, the Clanton gang um, to represent theirs, and as you may know at this point, as if it's not obvious, there was a bit of a um, to do at the OK Corral. There was a very short gunfight. Um, three of the Clancy uh, gang were killed in that. Um, uh, John was wounded, as was uh, Wyatt Earp's uh, brother, who was uh, badly wounded. Uh, and and um, uh, so it didn't really end well. In fact, it didn't end well enough that um, both John and Wyatt Earp were accused of murder, uh, tried for murder. 
it seems like the trial was a lot more politics than it was uh, actually fact-based um, and um, they got off. Um, but from then on, um, John's life sort of went for the worst. If you haven't figured it out yet, um, and I think uh, many of you um, um, have, John was John Holiday or Doc Holiday. Um, and Doc Hall, the rest of Doc, and this is the story we know of Doc Holiday, but the rest of his, his life was not so good. He, um, his TV was progressive. Um, he was involved in several more shootings. He could, couldn't work as a dentist. Um, and he ended up um, pretty destitute. He moved to Colorado, um, to um, Glenwood Springs, Colorado, which had, uh, which was famous for its uh, cave, it's what were called the Indian Caves, uh, which had supposedly healing properties. They're really, really interesting geologically. They probably don't have any healing properties. Uh, certainly didn't work out for him. Um, so he ended up uh, destitute, um, it, living in a um, uh, in a um, rooming house uh, where he uh, went on to die at age uh, 38. Now, of course, this isn't the story that we always hear about him. Um, if you look at, um, if you watch movies uh, that include Doc Holliday as a character, they're pretty factually incorrect, I have to say. Um, this, this one where Jason, Jason Robard started, started as Doc Holliday, um, he had a really nice ending to his life living in this lovely nursing home with a uh, uh, playing cards with uh, the nurses. Um, uh, this one with Stacy Keach playing uh, Doc Holliday was actually more accurate in some ways. And you can see down there uh, the, uh, let's see, is that, is that a fancy thing here? Okay, anything could happen. No, that buzzes. Okay. All right, we're not doing that. Um, you can see here that uh, the, the hemoptysis that actually was showed up in the movie. You use the mouse to point? Okay. Oh, then it shows up on Zoom. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Vicki. Uh, yeah, that is, well, I think that's obviously hemoptysis. Um, <laughs> um, um, so it, it was, obviously a, uh, a, a, bit, um, a, a, a bit different. This probably works too, doesn't it? Cool. So Doc wasn't the only person to go to Colorado um, and out West uh, for their TV. Uh, in fact, it was before there was, there were sanatoria and the sanatorium movement, the first sanatorium wasn't built for another uh, 25 years after uh, the birth of, um, of John. Uh, and, but the idea that the environment was very important in TV was played very large. And the place to go was the newly expanding West and uh, where the air was dry, altitude was thought to play a role. Um, having lots of sunshine was thought to play a role. And actually maybe a little bit to that um, because they were they believed in sunshine as, as important and fresh air. People spent a lot of time outdoors. And so they would move into town, but many people lived in tents uh, so that they could be outside in the fresh air all day, uh, which as you know, um, Denver um, and the Rocky Mountains get a little cold. So people were living out in the winter, in the, in the Colorado winters. Um, that's when the sanatoria started to be um, uh, to be very big out there. We think of the first sanatorium, as, as, as you know, which was in Saranac Lake um, in the US, um, also up in the mountains, um, so a similar sort of environment. Uh, but really, the, the movement really caught on, and particularly in Colorado. Um, and there are all sorts of resorts uh, that were built. Um, lots of doctors moved into the area because there are opportunities to take care of uh, patients. And so it really grew, uh, grew Colorado. Um, and, and there were uh, books written about it. Some of the books really uh, praised the idea of, um, uh, of moving out here, thought that it was great. Others sort of gave more realistic accounts of how people were doing. Um, uh, and this was one of them. A actually, these are really interesting. To, these are, you can get these books out of, out of, uh, uh, Widener Library at Harvard, and they're really, it's really interesting to see some of these things that people said. For example, there was a 
the, the strength of evidence uh, for the cure of TB were things like a statement quoted in one of the books that said um, that, to my knowledge, no person in Colorado has, has gotten TB. This is from a surgeon out working in, in uh, Colorado, aside from Indians, and they don't count. Um, uh, so they were both um, not very good uh, medical scientists and racists. Um, some of these sanatoria were really nice. Um, this is a uh, particularly nice one, the Prospect Grove Sanatorium, which catered to very wealthy people. Uh, but there was every kind of income um, out there. Um, and there were, uh, there were colonies where everyone ha had an individual hut and could stay inside or outside. Uh, this was largely an open air sanatorium, the first one there. The, the, the pinnacle was Cragmore Sanatorium, which was uh, for the extremely wealthy. Um, uh, this was in Colorado Springs, um, uh, and it was big in the 1880s and 1890s. Now, should, something I should say about uh, Colorado Springs is that um, between 1880 and 1890, about a third of the population uh, had TB. Um, so this was extremely important in, in, in sort of building. Um, uh, and I can't, I don't think I can see all these uh, on the, uh, maybe, nope. Um, I can't read this whole quote because I can't, it doesn't all show up, but uh, Cragmore was a place where millionaires, musicians, artists, dancers, and poets came to get well and was known for its luxury, easy rules and, and sexual proclivities. Um, so, you know, it wasn't all bad to have TB if you were incredibly wealthy. It was just good to be wealthy, in fact. Um, um, but most TB patients, of course, weren't wealthy. Um, and uh, Colorado ended up attracting people that the city fathers, because the city mothers didn't have much say in this at the time, uh, were very happy to get these wealthy people living at Cragmore, and then a lot of destitute people who um, ended up with nothing. Um, not exactly nothing, because there were um, institutions that were um, being built to cater to these uh, people. Um, um, this is uh, Francis Weisbart, who was known as uh, the mother of charity in um, uh, in in, um, uh, in Denver, who who donated a big philanthropist who donated lots of money, including to uh, TB institutions um, uh, like uh, the National Jewish Hospital for Consumptives, um, which uh, which motto was um, "None may enter who can pay, none can pay who enter." So it was a free institution catering to people with TB and not, not just Jews. Although, interestingly, a lot of these, as we'll see, institutions were set up by individual groups of immigrants. Um, of course, this, yeah, I, I guess I could say this, this is a Jewish institution and this is uh, usually the case. Um, this is Dr. Charles Spivak, um, who was uh, educated in Russia, but uh, came over, was a professor of uh, gastroenterology uh, at Penn uh, but when his wife was mistakenly diagnosed with TB, decided to move to Denver. Um, and there was already a Jewish institution. So he thought it was important to found his own Jewish institution. So this was a competing Jewish institution uh, for treating Jewish uh, in, in indigent TB patients. Um, <clears throat> um, and it's not just Jewish hospital, Swedish hospital, which is a major hospital in, um, in, um, in, in, San, in, in uh, uh, Denver uh, was also founded to uh, cater to another, a different immigrant population. The Union Printer House, uh, which was for obviously members of the Union um, who were not wealthy people at all, um, ended up about 25,000 people ended up spending some time um, at this institution. And of course, it wasn't just these big institutions. Um, it was also individuals who were coming out there um, this is actually New Mexico. It's not, uh, it, it's not Colorado. Uh, nevertheless, um, this is where D.H. Lawrence, the writer D.H. Lawrence came uh, to uh, when he got TB to try to um, improve his health. Um, like as is with, true for many people, uh, moving out to the house, New Mexico um, didn't actually work, but it was, um, uh, it was, it was, it was common. So in Colorado um, in 1925, um, it's thought that about 60% of people who newly came to the, to the city came there because they or a relative had TB. Um, and there's this piece of 
internet lore, um, which probably isn't true, but it won't stop me from quoting it, um, which says that about 20% of the residents of Colorado today are descended from people who came there because of TV, usually because of a family member with TV. Um, I mentioned this fact in Colorado and a, um, uh, and someone in the audience uh, who was a TV researcher at Colorado State came up to me afterward and said, yeah, that's why we moved here. My, my, grand, my grandfather's sister um, had TV. So N of one, I think that proves it. Okay, you might notice that, that the, um, the title said a tale of two pandemics, and I haven't mentioned two pandemics uh, yet. So um, now I feel obliged to talk about that uh, a little bit. Um, so uh, you may have noticed that back when um, we were keeping count, um, which is not doing, not, we're not doing so well anymore at that, um, this is the most recent WHO um, uh, graphic um, showing the uh, almost 7 million deaths around the world. And of course, uh, the many hundreds of million of under, which is an undercount of uh, cases of COVID. Um, so here's something that's really changed. And like TB, of course, it's changed our, our society. Um, it certainly changed mine. This is the um, uh, uh, Countway Library at Harvard Medical School, which is where the head, the editorial offices are of the New England Journal up on the top floor there, um, where I used to spend all my time. This is where I spend most of my time now. Um, um, and, and of course, the, the social changes that have been engineered are huge. So how do we think about these two diseases as compared to each other? And um, and the kinds of measures that we can take to intervene in each one of them. So COVID has a course that we are all extremely familiar with. Um, it starts with an asymptomatic infection. And in many cases that infection resolves without any, um, uh, without, uh, or remains asymptomatic and don't feel anything. Uh, the, the course of disease we see now in, in immune individuals is largely this. Um, people have uh, present with symptoms, they're mild or moderate, they go away. Um, Occasionally, we used to see more commonly people who would get who would present with very severe illness, but they also had this kind of odd uh, pattern where people would get sick, um, they they stabilize or get better, um, and then they'd get worse. And a lot of the people who ended up in the hospital, a lot of people who ended up dying of disease, fit into more into this pattern than the pattern I just showed you. Um, and, and and what we know about the bi underlying biology is that there's a lot of viral replication early on, most of it occurring during the asymptomatic phase. Um, and, but, but viral replication falls um, over time and falls rather rapidly. And I'm gonna do, it's embarrassing to say this in front of immunologists, but uh, just in a hand wavy way, um, there, um, there's, there are kind of two waves of inflammation in, in this sort of bimodal presentation where the people get sick, they get a little better, and then they get into this inflammatory syndrome, hyperinflammatory syndrome, which um, can, which leads to uh, pulmonary, primarily pulmonary compromise, but other all, all sorts of other problems. TB is really different, and 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 still, after a long time, and um, I, I think this doesn't speak well to me as a researcher. I don't really have a good idea of what's going on. Um, there's subclinical infection that lasts for some amount of time, maybe years, um, followed by symptomatic infection. And during that time, um, there's a lot of bacterial growth when people are symptomatic, probably. We don't really know what's happening with bacterial growth during the preclinical period, and there's a lot of debate um, within the community. Clearly, though, uh, the, the inflammation is induced in part by the bacterial load, um, and with, an, with a high bacterial load, um, in, in the face of normal immunity, um, you get uh, symptoms. So, when you think about these two respiratory infections, how can you stop transmission? Um, well, you can stop transmission like we do for any other respiratory infections. There are social measures like masking, uh, like social distancing, uh, like uh, testing um, and testing together with uh, tracing. Um, and then there are social measures um, like uh, isolation and quarantine. Um, and it's interesting because TB is really the paradigm of quarantine. Um, it's really how we uh, think about uh, think about it. This is a story from uh, last week about a woman um, in 
uh, and Tacoma who has TB has made frequent visits to the court um, to have court ordered therapy and uh, most recently um, escaped and went to a, um, uh, went to a casino. Um, and in fact, this is the disease for which we still use quarantine, forcible quarantine um, in the, uh, uh, in, 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 in Boston, we have a hospital where we lock up people and there are always actually people locked up for TB who have uh, not uh, been, uh, been compliant with therapy. Um, and that's our major way of control. Interestingly, that it's, it's named for this guy, Lemuel Shattuck, who was not a doctor, um, not, not even remotely, he was a bookseller. Um, he actually gets credit as one of the founders of public health. This is on the freeze of the London School of Tropical Hygiene. Um, because he, after he retired as a bookseller, he put together a, um, a census of people in Boston and, and found that there was this huge rate of, uh, of infant mortality um, that he had not recognized before and, and became a big proponent of demographics of demography as a big part of public health. Um, anyway, enough about Shattuck. We know that these measures work, could work um, under the right circumstances. They worked in New Zealand, uh, they worked more or less in Iceland, which was not as severe as New Zealand. Um, of course, there was some resistance uh, to these, even resistance to the idea of masking, um, maybe a little more, more here in Missouri than we had back home. Um, so those measures work and they still work and we are not, they're not necessarily easy to implement as simple as they are. Um, so what about treatment? Um, we know that early treatment of disease works. This is a study from an arbitrarily chosen uh, journal um, on, on uh, nermatrivir, uh, which uh, uh, decreases uh, the rate of hospitalization and symptoms. Uh, this, you could say the same perhaps for molnupiravir. Um, actually, there's an interesting story about molnupiravir because you can see this difference here. Um, but um, if you look at the original um, press release uh, for this drug, it says that um, it has about 50% relative efficacy um, in this disease, which is really impressive and way better than the, than the figure that I just showed you. Um, and, and this talks about, I guess this addresses being a slave to your protocol because in the original protocol, this is true. The study was stopped early and they had this tremendous effect size. Um, the FDA, the journal asked the manufacturer to could you analyze all the other people because they'd already enrolled everybody else? And they said, no, no, that's not in our protocol. I said, you know, but, but you have all the data. It just seems kind of crazy not to look at these data. And when they looked at them in the second half of the study, the people on molnupiravir did worse than the people on placebo. And when you averaged it out, there was a small effect size, but no one knows why that happened, but um, it's, 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 it's very strange. And of course we don't use that drug anymore. And if you're able to use remdesivir, um, then, uh, then that also works um, if you use it early. If you use it late, it doesn't do very much uh, because there's not much, much viral replication. Um, um, of course, you don't use remdesivir much because it's an IV drug. There is an oral formulation, a kind of a, a related compound, uh, BB116. It's uh, now, you, now available in China. I'm not even sure they're pursuing this um, in, the, uh, uh, in the US, but this, this drug looks very similar to uh, 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 um, uh, to, to uh, nermatrivir in terms of its uh, efficacy. Uh, of course, we don't know how best to use these drugs. We've only tested nermatrivir for a five-day course. Um, is that the right way to give it? We don't know. We know that there are cases of rebound in rather prominent people, um, including uh, Dr. Fauci himself. Um, and in some of the authors of this, it's public knowledge that some of the authors of these letters of this letter here um, had rebound themselves and documented that uh, well. So we have drugs, is, but are, and they do work, but are they public health tools? For TB, treatment is really one of the fundamental aspects of control. Um, and, and that was shown very early on when uh, in these series of experiments where people with TB who were in a sanatorium were given a guinea pig and the guinea pig sat on a table in the uh, patient's room and these patients were instructed to cough on the guinea pig uh, whenever they cough. The guinea pigs are very susceptible to TB and uh, guinea pigs would get TB. But if you treated patients, then 
very rapidly, they became non-infectious, at least toward guinea pigs. Um, and, and, and there are many studies of this. In fact, there continue to be these guinea pig studies done in fancy airflow uh, 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 suites now. Um, but it, it, it remains our best bioassay for uh, transmission. Um, the problem with, with uh, SARS-CoV-2, of course, is that it, the viral replication occurs over a very short time. So if you treat, can you prevent disease? And the answer is prevent transmission. The answer is probably no, um, because if you, measure if you measure virus either by PCR and viral RNA or actually by uh, culture, um, um, it's over pretty quickly. So you're probably, and, and remember that even by the time you started and had symptoms, there's been a, rap, a very large drop in the amount of virus that's being shed. Um, so we know that we can help patients who are really sick with immunomodulators such as uh, corticosteroids and or IL-6 inhibitors or, uh, or um, uh, JAK, uh, JAK inhibitors, but, um, and, and, and those have at least a small effect on, uh, on survival. Um, but do they have any effect? Remember, these people are not transmitting. So this immunomodulation probably doesn't have anything to do with uh, preventing transmission. It might increase it. There is this kind of intriguing study that was published recently of uh, uh, interferon lambda in outpatients, which not only prevents um, some of the, uh, 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 reduces the rate of hospitalization as shown here, but also actually reduces shedding at least at late time points, but maybe not at early time points. So it's conceivable that sort of revving up the immune system to respond to the virus could, uh, could limit uh, some transmission, but it's never gonna be an important tool. So how about preventing it? Of course, we have this miracle of uh, these uh, vaccines that were incredibly effective, um, uh, both in, uh, in trials and, um, and in, uh, in real life. Um, and these are a couple of studies um, uh, from these early studies, but but um, um, you, you know they were better with a third dose, perhaps a little bit better with a fourth dose. Um, however, it was clear that there were problems. Um, this is a study from Cutter, I think, yeah, Cutter uh, that uh, showed that um, vaccines uh, that that vaccination with three doses was better than two. But you'll already see here that there are a lot more cases than we saw earlier, and as we all know, there's been a diminution in um, effectiveness both due to loss of immunity over time, but also due to the appearance of new viral variants that have been selected for. Um, and, and we've seen that in study after study after study. Um, and this one I'm just pointing out here where the effectiveness of two doses of vaccine was minus 4.9, well, at a point estimate of minus 4.9 as if vaccination was causing um, disease. It's just not working very well. So Vaccination is important. It still protects people against severe disease, but it's not so much of a public health tool um, as it was uh, once upon a time. I just want to end with a few lessons, a few takeaways from me um, from this. Um, the first, I, I have to say, since I'm here at a great hospital, um, the, the dedication of medical caregivers, um, physicians, nurses, other caregivers it was incredible. This was, it, you remember back to the very frightening time when we didn't really understand the disease, we didn't really understand transmission and people were taking risks, huge risks for themselves. And I think people should be reminded of that. That being said, um, there are other risks as it turned out and there are political risks, particularly against public health authorities that have been uh, truly ugly. Um, and they, they've de degraded our ability, I think, to respond to things. Second lesson is on uh, the development of therapies. Um, the, the path from uh, development to approval of the drug remdesivir was incredibly fast. Um, but remdesivir was already available. It had already been tested in humans for other in viral infections. It didn't really work, um, but it was there. And so it was relatively easy with a lot of help from regulators to get this drug approved. Nermatrovir is a more classic new chemical entity. Um, we started from scratch. Um, also, the development of that was also very rapid. Um, but the, the in, in this case, the benefit was uh, the sort of accumulation of technologies that have contributed to the development of small molecule therapeutics um, and also a regulatory pathway that allowed this drug uh, to be approved without a, a lot of the 
things that would be applied to um, other, other drugs. Um, I told you about VV106 before. Um, TB has benefited in the same way. It, it took a very long time. There was a very long lull. Well, first it took uh, 70 years from the uh, discovery of the agent, of the causative agent to the development of the first drug. There has been a big acceleration recently. There are several drugs that have been approved and are being used now um, in the last several years. And their the pipeline is quite large. There, there are at least five or six drugs in clinical uh, trials now with novel mechanisms of action. So it's, um, it's pretty impressive. Um, and those are being used and, and, and being applied with uh, uh, a, a great treatment, what, what looks like a really useful treatment for uh, a drug resistant TB, an all oral regimen, um, and a treatment strategy for, uh, uh, for drug sensitive TB, which seems to be able to drive the treatment period for most patients down to two months. That was uh, just, just uh, published last month. Vaccines, though, are really the uh, dramatic place where there's been a big impact. And you can see the amount of time it took to develop vaccines for lots of things. There are all these long timelines. Uh, and there, are, there are all these long timelines here, but there's a developmental dot um, here from uh, the first recognition. And of course, that was enabled in part by technology like the mRNA vaccines. But remember, the first approved vaccine for um, this was actually an, a slightly older technology, viral vectored uh, vaccines. And those, I think, offer a lot of promise, not just for th these kinds of things, for, for all kinds of diseases. And we are getting into an age of vaccines, uh, particularly for diseases that we either couldn't or were, un were uh, reluctant to develop vaccines for. There are now a couple of different viral vectored vaccines for Ebola that seem uh, pretty effective, even under the very trying circumstances of Ebola outbreaks. Um, and we have just published several studies of RSV vaccines that work well in adults. Um, this is an example, another example. This was published today, um, a, a trial that uh, had very high uh, efficacy. And, and even more interestingly, another a trial published today of um, vaccinating pregnant women to protect their infants, uh, which um, in this case uh, seemed to work. Small trial, uh, lots to learn, but, um, but um, that's really good. TB, though, has been a tougher nut to crack. Um, and it's not just a technology issue. It's really a biology issue. We, don't, we aren't very good at chronic infections um, and, and understanding how to protect immunologically against them. And so I think there is some promising evidence, like this study was published several years ago. But, but of course, introducing vaccines and vaccine mandates came with its own baggage. Um, and, and one worries about the damage that's caused because fewer people are getting vaccinated. We have big measles outbreaks killing lots of people in Zimbabwe, even though the measles vaccine has really effective and it's been around forever. Um, and of course, the polio pseudo outbreak occurring in New York, where polio is being seen at least in um, and, 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 and uh, continues to be seen even, uh, even as recently as last week um, in, um, in wastewater. So I think that um, we've created lots of opportunities um, in infectious disease. Um, we have also, they come with a new set of challenges. We're getting scientifically much, much better, developing new treatments, developing new transmission control strategies, uh, developing new preventive strategies, particularly in vaccines. Our public health response hasn't kept up with that. Um, and I think that that will remain a challenge for us. So thanks a lot for having me. Um, and those are the all important CME things. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. I think we have time for some questions. Bill. Oh. <clears throat> Thanks, Eric. That, that was wonderful. Um, one question in, in your role of both of thinking about this from an infectious disease perspective, but also as an editorial role, um, is you know, the big, one of our big challenges, and I think you've identified it, is that when we think about our role as scientists in getting the data out, but we also have a role in helping that data be properly interpreted. And where do you think we, what do we think we need to do, you know, in, in thinking of educating the next generation of physician scientists and 
how we did better at uh, communication. So um, Bill asks about uh, the last point they made, which was that um, we're we're good at, we're good scientifically, but we our communication skills as um, as doctors as researchers uh, probably are lacking because we're having trouble getting the message out. Um, and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm and I think about uh, your last Medoff lecturer was Rochelle Walensky, who is a friend and a neighbor of mine, uh, um, who has held some of that responsibility. She's great. She's, you couldn't imagine a better person to talk to you as your doctor um, um, and to be your mentor. But the communications problems that the CDC has had despite having her are quite evident. Um, and, and it suggests that it doesn't just take a great communicator like her or like Tony Fauci, who's really quite good. It takes a communication strategy. Um, and that is, I think that may require more than individual physicians and, uh, and researchers. I think we really have to think about how we're going to get messages out there um, as a group and not just as individuals. I don't think it's helped us a lot. It, 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 I think. You know, on one hand, individual physicians talking to individual patients has proven to be the most effective way of educating um, individuals, but it's not a scalable, it's not scalable, and I don't think we have that scalable knowledge right now. Um, so things are going to have to change. I'm not sure I have the answer, so. I'll ask you a TV question. Okay. So, you know, um, for many years, one of our biggest strategies for the prevention of activation of TB was prophylactic INH for you know, exposures and early infections. And, and now we have a you know very large population of older people with multiple immunosuppressive diseases. Uh, what do you think about additional strategies to prevent those patients from reactivating the TB? So th thanks, Vicki. It's a, it's a great question. So I think that um, uh, what we called chemoprophylaxis, but might actually be treatment of subclinical uh, TB, has been incredibly effective, including for that group of patients who are newly starting TNF inhibitors and such. Uh, uh, and, and so that remains sort of our cornerstone. Are there better ways we could go about it? Um, well, I think there are two sorts of approaches. One is in the antibiotic space where uh, the um, uh, where antibiotics have been shown to, where we've been able to shorten the course um, quite significantly for these, uh, these regimens, uh, which really helps in people who are sick and people who are gonna be taking other medications where, where there can be medication interactions. Um, so, so I think we're getting better at those sorts of management uh, questions, even with existing antibiotics. Newer antibiotics might even be better for this particular scenario. Some of them have very long half-lives, um, so they can be administered a single time um, or very, or maybe a very uh, small number of doses, um, and those have not been trialed. Um, so that would be useful. I talked about vaccines, and one scenario for the use of vaccines is in this group of patients who have low burdens of uh, bacteria and are able to control them. Is it conceivable that we could have sterilizing immune, induced sterilizing immunity in these people, even if we can't in people who have active disease and large bacterial burdens? Possible. So I think um, that is, when, when you look at a lot of the vaccine trials that are going on, um, they exclude people who are um, skin test positive or, or um, um, interferon gamma release assay positive. Uh, but it would be interesting to look at that population to see if you can stop TB from developing. Um, and uh, those trials aren't going under, aren't underway. They're super ex huge and expensive. Here, uh, I have a task for you. Uh, the FDA is very burdensome and very difficult to get these two years. When did you get I'm looking up an email here um, because I, I just want to read an expurgated version of it. 
Um, this uh, this from a, a proposal that an author sent in to us for a, a, a perspective article. It says, uh, uh, what the F do Texas judges know about FDA drug approvals from 20 years ago? That was the proposed title. Um, <laughs> um, uh, it, it's really important. I, I think that there is a lot of potential innovation in the regulatory area, but it's really important that we have transparent rules that people can understand. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And if we're able to go to a court and um, and overturn decisions uh, left and right of the major regulatory body, there's no predictability. So aside from the fact that this particular decision was not in all in any way driven by, uh, by facts, um, even for factual questions, we have to have a, some a real authority um, um, in making these decisions. Drug development is crazy expensive. Um, and even though I think that we all know that there is, uh, that there's a lot of money involved and there may be some corners cut, et cetera, and some of these things, it, it's a huge triumph of modern medicine. And I think we wanna really facilitate that. And, and judgments like this have a huge impact, I could have a huge impact if they, if they are upheld. Thanks for the question. You might, you thought I might be talking about something interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I'll repeat that. So Shash is asking, um, what, what is our role in, um, in, and whose role is it to promulgate some of the measures that we know are effective apart from all, you know, apart from making a new vaccine um, against the virus and um, all this happening in the context of huge epidemics like TB, like, um, like some of the influenza epidemics like, like COVID, which are, producing all the societal change at the same time. Um, it, it, it's been really challenging. Uh, and we, I think everyone in this room has faced the situation of a patient or a, a relative um, coming to you and saying, you know, I read this uh, piece of information on the internet. Uh, why are you guys doing this? Um, now, first off, we guys are not necessarily doing that. <laughs> and secondly, what you read on the internet might not be right. So how do we play a role in counteracting some of the wrong information out there and in, in counteracting it with good information. It, getting back to Bill's question, the answer is I, I'm not sure. Certainly as a medical journal editor, I'm asked all the time about these things by reporters. Um, and I, my own feeling is that I'm, I'm much more useful telling them what is true than telling them what is not true, than trying to stamp out every falsehood out there. Um, and, and my own way of doing that is, is the doctor's way of doing it, which is always, um, if this were me, or if this were my mother, um, here's what I do, given what I know. Um, and um, yes, I did vaccinate my children. Um, you know, I've read everything and I vaccinated my kids. I, um, 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 and, 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 uh, and yes, I, I wear a mask when I go out in public, um, not, not as much anymore, but, um, um, uh, and, and I think we have to live as infectious disease physicians or physicians in general, 
we have to leave lives of example as much as as as, as much as anything. Um, but I still think we need a a better model for for communicating with the public, and I not sure what that is. And I'm not sure it's gonna come up from doctors. I'm not sure it's gonna come from public health professionals. It's likely to come from 20 year old programmers, but, um, uh, but we need those people um, to help us spread that message. Sure, thank you.